And it is my delight to introduce to you our very own Angela Center Steiner, the director of Africana Studies and the director of the Anthropology Program. She publishes all over the place. She is one of our slices for peace and justice. We are very honored to have her with us this morning. She has spoken here before. And so she's going to tell us about see no black, speak no black, hear no black, read no black. And you may take it away. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I hope you can hear me and I don't need to utilize the microphone. Uh, as Dr. Lane said, my name is Angela M. Siner, and I am the director of the University of Toledo's Africana Studies program. Uh, one of the programs, by the way, that is being attacked uh, throughout the country. And so when Dr. Lang asked me to. No, I'm Dr. Kilmer. I'm sorry, Kilmer, I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm thinking of somebody Dr. else. Lang does good work. But she's not you. But I'm the one who did this. Okay. So Dr. Kilmer asked me to present. I, I was actually reading something and uh, I looked at my uh, bookcase and there were the three monkeys. Uh, hear no evil, speak no evil, right? Um, and I said, what could I title this, this, this topic? And so that's what I decided to, to name the topic. Um, hear no evil, see no evil, speak no evil. And so uh, in order for me to deal with banning black books, I have to look at it from a historical perspective. And one of the things that I know for sure is that the ideas that are here and we're dealing with in 2020-23 are not new. Uh, so the ideas that we're dealing with now in regards to censure is that for African-American history in particular, uh, there is attacks. And the attacks are on the teaching of African-American history and culture, everything from AP courses to Amanda Gorman's poem. And for those of you who know, Amanda Gorman was the youngest inaugural poet. Uh, her poem, uh, the, the Hill We Climb, uh, has been censured in Florida. So everything from AP courses to uh, Aunt Amanda Gorman's poem uh, has been censured. The other thing we know is that 44 states, including Florida, Texas, and Ohio, have put into effect uh, bans and restrictions on what can be taught, particularly what can be taught in regards to lessons around race uh, and racism. And I highlighted Texas for the reason, uh, particular reason, because Texas leads the way. Uh, Florida has done a lot, but Texas is leading the way at this particular point uh, in time. Uh, what do we mean by this? See no black, hear no black, speak no black, read no black. So you can't read anything about race, racism, traumatic events, LGBTQ plus issues, uh, critique of American history or culture, even one's own biography. Uh, and so Ruby Bridges, who was the young girl in New Orleans, who integrated New Orleans public schools, has written a beautiful story about her life. That book has been banned. So young children who are her age, uh, when she attended the first time at, in the school in New Orleans, young children who are her age cannot read her book. And so the topic areas are, vi are varied. Uh, they're considered devices. The other part of see no black, hear no black, speak no black, read no black, is that you cannot make students feel uncomfortable, discomfort, guilt, anguish, psychological distress. I was listening to ta Coates give a speech a couple of days ago, and one of the things he said is that when students began to ask for safe places on campuses, it was a huge battle. Uh, they were not given safe Places on campus. And he says to, today in 2023, entire institutions are safe places, right? So at one point they were arguing, no, you cannot have a safe place if you are a member of the LGBTQ plus community, if you are a member of the African American community. And today he said entire schools are safe places. Not a bad thing, but just the idea to juxtapose of what happened then and what's happening now. Uh, the fragility of our students, uh, he says, is at an all-time high. 
Uh, and so we can't make students feel uncomfortable. We can't uh, d d you know, make them feel uh, uh, anguish over any topics that we're talking about. And so he asked the question, what will happen to our students in the future when they have to deal with the real world, right? And so these topic areas and these standards that these institutions have put into place, and then there are penalties in 2023. So if you talk about divisive topics, if you talk about racism, if you make students feel uncomfortable, there are penalties that you will have to face. And here are just some of them. You can be reprimanded, you can be dismissed from your job, you can be harassed by administrators, students, parents, and the community. In some places, it's, you're gonna be charged with a felony. In the state of Florida, it is a third degree felony. If you are teaching a book, that is not on the approved list. A third degree felony. Uh, Professor Kilmer just mentioned Indiana, right? Another place where it's a felony. And so what are we going to do? How are we going to talk about these topics and particularly in the area that I teach in? How do I talk about race? How do I talk about racism? How do I talk about slavery, the civil rights movement? These are all topics that are being banned. These are topics that are being censured. And individuals believe that maybe it just happened in 2020, uh, maybe it happened beginning in 2020, 2016, 2020, 2023, but it's been going on for a very long time uh, in regards to the history and the culture of people of African American descent. And so we ask the question why? Why? If you go back historically to the time period known as the Harlem Renaissance, in the 1920s, many of the Harlem Renaissance writers could not even be published because their work was seen by publishers, newspapers, and publishing houses as obscene, seditious, dangerous, and many of them were critiquing the injustices of American society, and so there was no place for them to publish. And so what they did is that they went into the homes in Harlem, because this was the epicenter. Uh, Alelia Walker, who was the granddaughter of Madam C.J. Walker, who was the um, first self-made woman millionaires in America. And she was self-made because she did not get her money from her father. She did not get her money from her husband. She got her money from her own hard work. Well, her granddaughter, Alelia Walker, had a brownstone in Harlem. And so all the writers of the Harlem Renaissance, Zora Neale Hurston, Langston Hughes, Paul Lawrence Dunbar, right? They all went to her home and they would sit around and read their works to each other. Eventually, they came together to publish their own magazine called Fire. Well, it was only one publication in 1926. And interestingly enough, Fire, the one magazine put together by the writers of the Harlem Renaissance was destroyed in a fire. And so the Harlem Renaissance, right? The narrative that they were fighting against then, and I think in some ways now, is the prevailing narrative of African-American people, that they are intellectually inferior, that they are biologically inferior, that they are socially unfit, that Africa was a dark continent, devoid of history, devoid of culture, devoid of civilization, and if Africa is devoid of history, culture, and civilization, that means Black people are devoid of history, culture, and civilization. And so that was the prevailing narrative that the writers of the Harlem Renaissance were writing against. And they were writing against this prevailing narrative through their own biographies, through their own histories, through their own interactions on a daily basis. And what is the counter narrative? The counter narrative is, that Black people have history, they have culture, they have a way of life, they are contributors to the world, they have accomplishments and achievements. They have critiqued American history, American culture, but above all else, Black people have agency. They were not passive in their uh, existence in America. Even during the period of enslavement, they were able to create family, culture, religion, music, art, dance, right? That they were not passive in their existence in America during the period of enslavement. 
This gentleman here, Dr. Carter G. Woodson, who I'll talk about in just a moment, Dr. Carter G. Woodson said, it's not just about black history, because this is what most people think when you think about Africana studies or black studies courses, that you're only talking about black history. But Dr. Carter G. Woodson said, it's not only black history, but blacks in history, right? Not just black, black history, but blacks in history. And why do I mention Dr. Carter G. Woodson? I'll talk about him in just a moment. This idea of censure of African-American history and African-American culture, as I just laid out to you, we think these ideas are just in 2023, but this is a continuum in American history and American culture. During the period of enslavement, plantation owners could do anything they wanted to their enslaved Africans. They could beat them, they could sell them, they could sexually exploit them. But the one thing the law said they could not do was to teach them how to read and teach them how to write. This gentleman here, Frederick Douglass, who, by the way, was the most photographed American in the 19th century. Frederick Douglass was taught how to read as a child by his plantation mistress as she taught her own child. The plantation owner comes in one day and he sees her teaching Frederick how to read and how to write and he goes ballistic. And in his ballisticness, he says to her, you can no longer teach him how to read, you can no longer teach him how to write. It's against the law. Frederick Douglass, however, had caught the bug and he wanted to continue to learn how to read and how to write. So what he would do is, as the young plantation owner's son was having his, his lessons, he would stand outside the window, pretending to pick rocks, to pull grass, so that he could hear what was going on. I just read a biography about him as well. And in the biography, they said his grandmother worked in the big house. And she was a fantastic cook. And she would make cookies and cakes. And so Frederick Douglass would take cookies, and he would go down to the docks, and he would play with the young Irish children in the docks in Virginia. Uh, in his area, and he would give them cookies for them to teach him more letters. But here's the thing. Frederick Douglass learning how to read and learning how to write was a, a, a catastrophe for the institution of slavery. And at the very least, he could be whipped, his fingers could be cut off, and at the most, he could be killed. So at great peril to his own life, Right? He continually attempted to find things to read. And, and as, as one author said, it wasn't even whole books sometimes. Sometimes it was just scraps of paper. And finally, when he made it to freedom in 1848, and he goes to Philadelphia, the Anti-Slavery Society, and his first night there, he gives a speech. And according to the records of the time, he was so eloquent in his speaking that individuals said, there's no way. He could have ever been a slave. And he stood before them and he said this. He said, I stand before you tonight as a thief. I stole this head and these limbs. In other words, he was saying to them he was a former slave. And if he had not run away, he would have still been a slave. And so learning to read and to write was, was a, an affront to the institution of slavery. Black Americans at the end of slavery wanted education. Above everything else, they wanted land, they wanted to reunite, re reunite with their families, and they wanted education. One individual went so far as to say, to remain illiterate is to remain a slave. And so with the help of church organizations, with the help of the uh, Bureau of Refugees, Freedmen, and Abandoned Lands, schools were open for the freedmen in the South. Uh, we know that beginning in the 1890s, the establishment of HBCUs, uh, historically black colleges and universities, but even before that, individuals were holding classes in barns, under trees, in churches, uh, in somebody's parlor, because individuals wanted to know how to read and how to write. Young people taught old people, old people taught each other, children taught each other as well. Why did they want to read? First and foremost, black folks wanted to know the Bible because the Bible, they had been told during the period of enslavement that somehow God had ordained them to be the slaves. 
And so they wanted to read it for themselves. So they wanted to read the Bible. They wanted to sign their names. And we know signing your name, if you don't can't write, you always put a what? An X, right? They did not want to be cheated. So when they brought their cotton or their rice or their tobacco to the, to the houses to be weighed, they wanted to be able to know the numbers that they had. They also wanted to mark their existence in writing. You know, people of African descent are an oral people. And so much of the history was passed down in the oral tradition, but they wanted to write it down. There is an individual here at the University of Toledo who is a secretary too, I think, in the math department. Her name is Deborah, Mrs. Deborah Middleton. And Mrs. Deborah Middleton has done an extraordinary job on her genealogy. She can trace her ancestry all the way back to Africa. Extraordinary job. And I always have her present to my classes. And she always comes in and talks about her family and, and what she's found. And one of the things she said in one of the presentations is that she was looking for the family Bible. And she goes to South Carolina and she finds her oldest aunt and her oldest aunt has the family Bible. And the family Bible, right? If you, if you take a Christian Bible, the first 20 or so pages in the, in the front, have a lot of blank pages, births, deaths, right, marriages, other events. And she wanted to find the Bible because she, she, she thought, and she was correct in that thinking, that this would, would be the place where she would find the history of her family. And she did. And in that Bible, the family Bible, she found marriages, dates for marriages, for deaths, for births, all of that information. But one of the things she said, which always stuck with me and I thought was very interesting, she said as she flip, flipped through those pages, the handwriting changed. Sometimes it was very neat, sometimes it was very sloppy, sometimes it was big, sometimes, so the handwriting changed. And she pondered on that for a while. And then she finally asked a member of the family, why are there so many different writings in here? I know, you know, writing, you know, it's not all standards, not all the same writing style. And the person answered with one question, I mean, with one answer. Whoever knew how to write was the scribe. So if you knew the one in the family who could write, you were going to write. And whoever knew how to write would be the scribe for the family. So the Bible for individuals of African-American descent becomes the place where they begin to tell their own stories. And the thing that, that is interesting to me is this. Why do they want to tell their own stories? Because I think of this African proverb. Until the lion writes history, the hunter will always be victorious. You have to tell your own story. How do you fit in to this society that we call America? You have to tell your own story because if you allow other people to tell it, they'll tell it from their vantage point. And so African-Americans, once they got letters, began to write their own stories. This gentleman here, Dr. Carter G. Woodson. Dr. Woodson is called the father of Black history. He was the second African-American to receive his PhD from Harvard. Uh, he received it in history. The first was W.E.B. Du Bois in 1896. And here is Dr. Carter G. Woods, and he wanted to write his dissertation, or actually he wrote his dissertation on Virginia and how Virginia had changed after the Civil War. And he was writing it from an economic standpoint. He had a battle with his committee. They refused in 1912 to allow him to publish his dissertation. And the question that I always ask is why? It's probably because of the questions and the conclusions that Dr. Woodson came up with in regards to the history of Virginia after the Civil War. What made Virginia, the column, the state of Virginia, what were the engines that drove it? And after the Civil War, what were the engines that stopped? And much of the engines were those individuals of African-American descent. So his, his dissertation was never published. But one of the things that he did after he left Harvard in 1926, he is the individual who established Negro History Week. 
one week in February, beginning in 1926, where he would discuss, or students would discuss the history, the culture, and celebrate the achievements and accomplishments of individuals of African American descent. One week. And, and I have to say this because students, particularly African American students, always ask the same question Why did he choose the month of February? The shortest month of the year? Coldest month of the year? Why would he choose February? Anybody know why he chose February? Who said it? That's it. He was honoring two individuals who were born in the month of February. One was Abraham Lincoln, and the other was the venerable Frederick Douglass. Now, Frederick Douglass really didn't know when his birthday was, but he selected February the 14th as his birthday. And so in honor of those two individuals, he chose the month of February, the first week, second week in February, to honor their history and to talk about the history, the culture, and the achievements and accomplishments of individuals of African-American descent. And then in 1976, uh, President, President Gerald R. Ford, uh, is the president who signed the proclamation declaring February African American History Month or Black History Month. Uh, and again, Dr. Woodson said this. He said, I, 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 will, I hope there comes a time in the history of America where we do not have to set aside any time, a month, a week, to discuss the history of African Americans. Because again, it's not about African Americans the history of African Americans is African Americans in history. So how can we pull them into the history of America uh, without having it a separate month? But until that happens, we can debate that. He started an organization called the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History. It is now called the Association for the Study of African American Life and History, also known as ASALA. Uh, they are the ones who are responsible for Black History Month themes. And this month, this year, uh, the Black History Month theme was Black resistance. This woman here, Zora Neale Hurst, an anthropologist, a folklorist, a writer of the Harlem Renaissance. Uh, their eyes were watching God. I don't know if any of you have heard of that book, right? In 1927 and 1928, Zora Neale Hurston went to Alabama. And she went to Alabama to interview a gentleman by the name of Kudjo Kaslulu Lewis, who would eventually die in 1935. Now, what's important about him? He was the last survivor of the, the last slave ship that came to the United States of America. For those of you who know American history, according to the US Constitution, the international slave trade was to end in 1808. So after 1808, it was in frank, flagrant violation of the law to go back to Africa and bring enslaved Africans back to the US. In 1860, a captain in Alabama made a bet that he could go to Africa, get Africans, bring them back to the United States without being penalized. And in 1860, that's exactly what he did. He went to the present day country of Benin, then it was called Dahomey, and he purchased 110 individuals. And he came back to the United States, went up the Mobile River, got the individuals off the ship and sunk the ship. This gentleman here was about 12 years old uh, at the time. And he lived through four years of enslavement, Slavery ends, the Civil War ends in 1865. He then becomes free. And in 1927, 1928, Zora Neale Hurston goes to Alabama to interview him. The interview goes extremely well. She writes a book. The book is titled Barracoon. And Barracoon were those uh, slave pins that were used to hold Africans on the continent of Africa before they put them in the dungeons and then onto the ships. And she titled it Barracoon. She writes the book. She goes to her editor and her editor says, no, we will not publish the book. You have a choice because the book that she wrote 
was written in Negro dialect. The way Cudgel talked is the way she wrote. Her book. And the editor says, no, it's not going to happen. So you have a choice. You either change the wording and put the words in standard English, or the work is not going to be published. Well, Zora Neale Hurston, being Zora Neale Hurston, told him no. It's not going to be published. And so what did they do with it? They threw it in a book on a shelf someplace. Somewhere around 19, 20, 20, 2015, somebody actually found a copy of the manuscript. And in 2018, the book was published. A foreword was written by Alice Walker, and just the way Zora Neale Hurston wrote it was the way it was published. Now, do you want to hear something that's really apropos? That's in 218. In 219, archaeologists and divers and historians are digging in the Mobile Bay, and they find the ship. And the name of the ship was the Clotilda. So 2018, the book is published. 2019, the ship that the captain scuttled, because he did, he burned it and sunk it into the Mobile Bay. Uh, in 2019, the ship was found. And so you're probably saying, what is she, why is she talking about all of this? I'm talking about this to say, to say to you that this is a continuum of censorship, continuum of censorship in terms of African-American history and African-American culture. The reason why Dr. Woodson started Black History Week and then eventually becomes Black History Month is because he was denied the opportunity as a student to write about or to publish what he really wanted to publish, which was the history of Virginia and the impact that slavery and the end of the Civil War had on Virginia. And this is why he comes to this, uh, this juncture of establishing uh, Asala at that time period. In 1969, the first Africana Studies or Black Studies program was established at San Francisco State. And it came out of, again, a fight, a battle. The students had to fight to have classes and ultimately a, a department of Africana Studies. And I put UT up here for a reason, because the UT Africana Studies program doesn't start until 1997. But in 1970, I don't know if any of you were around in 1970, but in 1970, African American students literally shut down University Hall. They commandeered University Hall, shut it down. And they had some specific uh, things that they wanted the University of Toledo to do. One was to hire more African-American faculty. One was to establish a Black Studies program. One was to increase African-American students on campus. And they shut it down. And the university in 1970 promised them that they were going to do this. And they didn't. They offered some courses. They hired a couple of more African-American faculty members, and that was it. Fast forward to 1996, 95, 96, the Black Student Union, young man by the name of Jeff Johnson, uh, had a protest on campus. They literally walked from the University of Toledo to the president's house on Bancroft Street. And President Horton was the president of the university at the time. He was actually hosting the board of trustees at his home. And here are all these students, Bullhorn and all these students converging on his lawn. And he comes out red faced, talks to the students and makes a promise. And the promise is that a committee will be formed and they will eventually establish a, a program. Well, thank goodness there were faculty members on campus who had already been working in that vein, uh, Dr. Helen Cooks, uh, Dr. Ruben Patterson, and by the time this program was established in 1997, uh, they had already laid the groundwork for it. The student protest just sort of spurred it on. But again, the notion of the idea of censorship, of fighting for African Americans uh, in regards to uh, their history and their culture, being banned. This woman here, Toni Morrison, who passed away in 2019, uh, beginning in the 1990s, she was the most banned African uh, banned author in America. So she was banned since the 1990s. Her books, The Bluest Eyes, uh, Song of Solomon, right? 
a tar baby. All of these books banned. This individual, Maya Angelou, I know why the cage bird sings, banned. James Baldwin. Anybody know James Baldwin? Has heard his name, right? Banned. Amanda Gorman, who again, the youngest inaugural poet in America, gives her speech at the, uh, gives her speech or reads her poem. Last year, it was banned in Florida. And I heard somebody say, I think the author said, individuals will ban your book, even though they've never read it. Ban her in Florida. Tallahassee Coates, he is a, uh, an author. Uh, he's a professor at Howard University. Uh, he's also a journalist. He wrote a book entitled Between the World and Me. And this book is patterned on uh, James Baldwin's lecture to his nephew in the book, The Fire Next Time. And in The Fire Next Time, James, Bal James Baldwin writes a letter to his nephew in 1963, letting him know what life is like for a black man living in America and what he could possibly expect and how he's supposed to conduct himself in the world. Tallahassee Coates writes this book, Between the World and Me, as a letter to his son giving his son the ideas of what it's like to be a black man in the 21st century and how he has to conduct himself in the world and what could possibly happen. His book has been banned. Uh, we're in October, last month, September, a uh, teacher in South Carolina teaching an AP course at the school that she had also attended as a student. And now she's a teacher there. And she has a list of books that the students could read. And one of the books that they had to read was Between the World and Me. The students complained. They complained to their parents. They complained to their administrators. They said the book made them feel uncomfortable. The book made them feel guilty for being white. The book made them feel uh, psychologically under stress. And so the teacher was reprimanded. Uh, a letter was put in her file, and if she does anything like that again, she can ultimately be fired. And in interviewing her, the thing she said that hurt her the most was that students turned her in. Not the parents, but the students. And so banning books, uh, the history and the culture of African-American culture is not just about banning books, but it's about banning African-American history. It's about banning African-American culture. And I know my time is getting short, but I'll leave you with this. What can we do? First of all, we can follow the edict of Henry Highland Garnett, who said, let your motto be resistance. Resistance. Send letters to your lawmakers. Read banned books. Purchase banned books. Attend board meetings. Form book clubs with banned books, particularly banned books that are black banned books. Students, what can you do? You can do walkouts. You can attend school board meetings. You can lead anti-censorship book club. Book clubs. There should be no S there. Book clubs. Uh, I was very proud to read that in Big Walnut High School in Columbus, Ohio, and in Pennsylvania Central York School District, students actually challenged their school boards about banned books. Their parents did, uh, but that didn't seem to be any credence with the parents when the students did. The whole situation changed. And finally, Frederick Douglass's words, power concedes nothing without a demand. There should be an H there. It never has, and it never will. And so if you are inclined to fight against the, the powers that be, so I want you to do two things for me. I want you to try to find these words, and as soon as you find them, so if you find Morrison, say Mars. If you find Baldwin, say Baldwin. Angel Lily. I found one. This is okay, Angelou. Oh, 
Only hear Angela. Morrison. Walker. Personnel. Personnel. Thomas. Thomas. Did everybody find Gorman yet? Butler. Pardon me? Butler and Gorman are missing. We got Butler. Butler. Foreman. Angelou. Walker. Foreman. Butler. Kirsten. Thomas. Morrison. Ellison. Baldwin. Coates. Everybody find them? You didn't? I want to leave you with this. See black. Speak black. Hear black, read black. Thank you very much. I think I think I'm, I'm not supposed to stay for questions. There was a lot of information in a short period of time. <laughs> yes, sir. I'm sure you know about this, but I rather thought it's by a black woman. Had three days all the way to school, applied to Princeton and Yale, and they interviewed her and said no, because they are pretending to be okay. They would hire a black man or a white woman, but a black woman, forget it. People would think they're overreacting and we're not doing it much. Yes. He wound up in a low level college down south. Uh, that's an interesting story because the same thing happened to W.E.B. Du Bois. Du Bois applied to Harvard. He grew up in Great Barrington, Massachusetts. He applied to Harvard, sent in his information. Harvard accepted him until he went for his interview. And when he went for his interview, they denied him. And so he went, he left Harvard and he attended Fisk in Tennessee, which is an HBCU, right? I don't know if any of you have ever heard of Fisk. University in Tennessee. Okay. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? No questions. Well, I'm done. Thank you. So there's no more questions. Do you like being a professor at the University of Toledo like I did? That's putting me on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I'll say this to say this. I love my students. There you go. So, so I'm to go with that. I love my students. <laughs> and I think they like me. I don't know. But I, I know I